Welcome. My name is Mark Rohan. I'm the Vice President of Research at Internet Retailer, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. We'll be discussing best practices and what it takes to build a business-to-business e-commerce platform and technology ecosystem. This is a very hot topic, as a growing number of manufacturers, wholesalers, and distributors are focusing on selling and marketing online, and in many cases, moving significant business to the web. But still a new field for many of these companies, and many companies are still trying to figure out the technology end of all this especially finding and implementing the best technology and ecosystem that works for them. Our panelists today will be addressing these key issues. We have Andy Hoare, who is the Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. We have Elaine Schechter, and we have Kevin Lebeck from uh, EPAM, who will be talking about defining, developing, and deploying digital business strategy. We also have case studies. So, We'll take your questions with Q&A at the end of the panel, and EPAM is the sponsor of today's webinar. But first, just a few numbers to kind of set the stage here for our discussion. Well, Internet Retail started out covering online retailing, as our name suggests, for the last couple of years. We've also been reporting on B2B commerce, and we're expanding our coverage in a big way this year. We started with our B2B e-commerce newsletter, B2C e-commerce news, which we've now been publishing weekly for a year and a half. This is now twice weekly. In August, we launched a website dedicated solely to covering B2B e-commerce. It's called B2B e-commerce world, and it will be providing daily news updates on how companies like yours are selling online. And the latest B2B expansion project is our just published 2016 B2B e-commerce 300, our first rankings of manufacturers, wholesalers, and distributors selling online based on their, an, on their online sales. Some of you may know that Internet Retailer has been publishing for years our top 500 rankings of online retailers. Now, we're doing the same thing year in, year out going forward for looking at who is the most successful of the B2B sellers. If you would like your company to be included in this guide and get credit for this groundbreaking work, you're no doubt doing an e-commerce, then please contact us at the above email address. As you can see, it's B2B research at verticalwebmedia.com. Before Andy begins, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to set the stage for our discussion. The first thing to know about B2B is that it's big and getting bigger and growing steadily all the time. According to estimates of Forrester Research, it's more than double the size of U.S. online retailing, at least in dollars spent, about $780 billion in 2015. The 300 largest manufacturers, wholesalers, and distributors ranked in B2B e-commerce world's 2016 e-commerce 300 grew even faster. Collectively, the companies we ranked for the first time this year grew their combined sales 13.3% to $547.1 billion. In comparison, Forrester projects that B2B commerce in the U.S. could top $1.1 trillion, that's trillion with a T, in five years. The second thing to know is that B2B is a complex market. While practically every good-sized retailer sells online through its own e-commerce site, that's not the case for companies focused on B2B e-commerce. E-commerce for manufacturers of all sizes takes multiple forms, and frankly can take years to implement. Manufacturers may operate an e-commerce site that's open to all, or they may create a password-protected site only for approved customers. And many manufacturers sell online in other ways, via web-connected procurement software linked directly to a customer's enterprise resource planning system. Uh, they may use a commercial network, such as that operated by companies such as Ariba, or they may use industry exchanges such as Covicent, and Exeter in the defense and aerospace manufacturing industries. And finally, they may even use online marketplaces operated by eBay, Ali Group, Alibaba Group, and others. Here is a ranking of the top 10 manufacturers with the most B2B web sales per our 2016 B2B e-commerce 300. It's a diverse group. 
This includes 87 manufacturers, uh, six distributors, six retailers, and one wholesale. And as the complexity of the 100 largest companies ranked in our new, in our new 300 guide, 75% use four types of channels and programs to sell online to their business customers compared with just 18% for just one channel and 7% with just three channels. And that's, where our speakers will be, and that's what our speakers will be, will be addressing today, how to deal with this complexity when building a state-of-the-art and integrated B2B e-commerce technology platform. Again, our speakers will be Andy Hoare, uh, Elaine Schechter, and Kevin LeBlanc from, uh, from EPAM. Remember, you can ask questions at any time using the question box on your screen, and we'll take those questions at the end. And everyone on the call will get an email in the next day or two with instructions on how to obtain today's presentation. Take it away, Andy. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, I really appreciate you uh, moderating this uh, discussion. And by the way, congratulations on the B2B e-commerce 300. That was a great achievement and a wonderful step forward in the space. So well done. So uh, great to be here. As uh, folks know, uh, who know me, um, I love talking about B2B e-commerce. And so any opportunity I get, um, you know, I take it, and uh, today is no exception. So what I'll be talking about for the next uh, 20, 25 minutes or so is, um, is the notion that when you build a world-class e-commerce system, there are a lot of nuts and bolts about it, and um, it's very complicated, uh, it's very important, um, and it's very difficult. Uh, because it you know, has all three of those dimensions to it, you know, doing something like this on your own is not impossible, but I would argue ill-advised. And it's ill-advised for a couple of reasons, uh, you know, beyond the fact that it's complicated and the like. You know, unlike 15 years ago when B2C started out, when there wasn't a lot of experience present in the space, today there is. There's several companies out there, uh, and I'll talk about this in a moment, several partners out there who have kind of already been there and done that on the B2C side at a minimum, at a maximum, some of them have actually been there and done that on the B2B side as well. So to not benefit from their experience and their knowledge, I think would, uh, would be a mistake. Um, you know, when you've got people who have actually led you that in the past before, they, they've made mistakes, fixed the mistakes, made more mistakes, and fixed those mistakes as well. And uh, it's a bit silly to think that you would want to kind of make those mistakes and, uh, you know, and reinvent a lot of the wheel here as you're going through when you have the opportunity not to have to do that. But sort of just set the stage here for, for jumping into this conversation. I'm going to talk about really three things in the next 20 minutes. One is what I see as a new normal, and I'll explain what that is in a moment. Two, uh, you know, doing this kind of development, building a world-class site, um, is not something you can just chunk off and hand off to a partner and say, go do it and bring it back. Um, you're going to be intimately involved, and I think our speakers will, will talk to that issue. You know, you as a practitioner, you as a world-class B2B company are going to be intimately involved in this. And I think it's important to think about the partnership that you'll develop, you know, less as a contractor relationship, and this might sound like a silly analogy, but more like a marriage <laughs> You're not dating somebody here for several years and spending, in some cases, several million dollars. You know, this person increasingly, or this team increasingly, is going to move in with you, live on your site, you know, eat food with you, sit in the same chairs, travel on the same planes, trains, and automobiles. So it's really critical, you know, that you think about it, again, more like a marriage and less like, you know, a date. Um, and because of that, it's going to require having sort of the right mindset. And then the last part, I'm going to touch quickly on some research we did um, a couple of months or published uh, about six to nine months ago around selecting a certain type of partner to really move something like this forward. But again, before I jump in, I want to make one really critical point. I was uh, at our own Forrester Forum uh, two weeks ago, actually, in Chicago, and one of my colleagues Martin Gill, who's written a, quite a bit about digital transformation, a respected voice in the field, actually introduced this concept, and I thought captured it quite well, and I think it sets the stage for what we're going to talk about. 
if you're a B2B e-commerce company, today is not about having a digital business strategy. Today is about digitizing your business strategy. I'll talk more about that in a moment, but let me just repeat that. It's about digitizing a business strategy. When you think about it in those terms versus having a digital business strategy, when you think about it as digitizing a business strategy, it is pervasive, it is cultural, it touches every aspect of your business, and it's very different from just having a quote-unquote bolt-on strategy, which we saw this in early B2C, we've seen this a bit in early B2B, where companies think that you know having a digital business strategy is just by, you know, is as simple as hiring some people, putting up <laughs> a website, uh, buying some technology, and pressing go. And I think what we're going to hear today uh, and going forward is that that's not true. So reset your mindset. Reset it to think, you know what, if we take our current business strategy and look for opportunities uh, and, frankly, needs, to digitize various dimensions of it, that's a more appropriate way uh, of thinking about it. Okay, on that note, let me kind of jump uh, in here. The new normal. All right, so, you know, I often say to companies, uh, and I've seen this a lot in, in B2B, that, you know, we live in the year 2015. You know, sorry for a Captain Obvious statement, but the reason it's an important and relevant statement is because I find too many companies are still thinking like it's 2005. So they're basically operating 2005 companies in the year 2015. What's the difference? Well, it's things like this. So earlier this year, we, uh, we did, I think, our third annual version of the B2B sell side survey, actually in partnership with Internet Retailer. And when we survey B2B companies and we ask them, how would you rate your company's B2B website customer experience? We give them two options. How would you compare your experience to that of your direct B2B competitors? So think, you know, a company that you compete with literally quite directly and have for years operate in your vertical, you know, the Coke to your Pepsi, the UPS to your FedEx. What we see is companies and tend to think of themselves as comparing quite favorably. When they say talk about their own experience, they say, you know, 46% said we're actually better than our direct competitors. Um, only 18%, which is a pretty small number here, right, say that they're actually worse than their direct competitors when it comes to their B2B website customer experience. But when we ask them, how do you compare to an Amazon-like customer experience, which, by the way, is now defining the standard for not just B2C but also B2B? Because as we all know, it's not like you go shopping on an Amazon-like property. When I say Amazon-like, I don't literally mean Amazon necessarily, but I mean an Amazon-like customer experience where we've come to expect, you know, one-click buying, um, you know, faceted and powerful search capabilities, uh, ratings and reviews, uh, personalized recommendations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of experience. And it's now been embodied in the phrase Amazon-like. It's the question I get asked quite a bit is from B2B companies, how do we create an Amazon-like customer experience? So they're not saying how do we create Amazon, but they're saying how do we create an Amazon-like customer experience? When we ask that question, when we put it to B2B companies, look at how it flips. Only 20% said they're better than Amazon. I'd love to meet those 20%, by the way, because I don't know exactly who they are. But um, I say that jokingly. There are some companies that do quite well, but you know, I'd, I'd love to meet them. I think the worst number here is quite accurate. You know, Two-thirds are basically saying when it comes to us versus an Amazon-like customer experience, we're worse. So... You know, if I was in front of an audience, I would say, show of hands, which one of these two things, can't do it here, but you can do it silently if you'd like, which one of these two realities do you think is the one you should be measuring yourself up against? I think if you're being honest with yourself, it's the Amazon-like customer experience, because guess what? That's what your customers are comparing you to. So effectively, we're starting this conversation with B2B companies, two-thirds of them, saying effectively, you know, we're not ready actually to compete. Uh, in the customer experience space. So that's part of the new normal. 
Another part of the new normal is even if you could, even if you had that sort of mentality, what our research shows, actually in the same survey, is that, you know, 72% say they actually can't, they don't have the systems in place to support it, even if they wanted to. So there's a, it's a multi-dimensional problem. One is recognizing that you're competing against the Amazon-like customer experience, and the other is coming also, I think, to the realization that you need to have certain processes and people, and in this case, technology systems in place to support that. Again, this is all sort of what the conversation today is about. And I would stress here again that this is, you know, an undertaking. This is not an easy thing. And when you're up against, you know, an Amazon-like customer experience, you're going to have to use partners to make it happen. And not only are you going to have to do it to really deliver, but you're going to want to do it. And it starts with having the right mindset. So we talked a little bit about the new normal. Let me talk to you a little bit about this is the world now. In addition to competing with an Amazon-like customer experience, I think it's really important to consider, I think there are four or five kind of key uh, realizations that you have to have. One is that we now exist in a real-time operating environment. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have real-time information. You know, let me give you an example. Um, somebody contacts your company at three o'clock in the morning. Say the you know the chief procurement officer or just an individual in an organization who's about to make a purchase of something on your site: safety gloves, you know, adhesive, a bolt fastener, electrical capacitor, what have you. <laughs> that person happens to be in Hong Kong, and they got an email during the day when they were back in you know Eastern Standard Time about an issue, and they're finally getting a chance to address it while online in a hotel in Hong Kong. And there's an important question they need to answer. Now, in Hong Kong, it's the early morning, but back in Eastern Standard Time where your company operates, it could be the middle of the morning. Well, this might be the chief procurement officer for you know General Electric. And you know this person who has a budget of tens of millions or even billions, and has you know, an important question. But if your company is incapable of addressing that question, let's say through a customer service rep or through a chat window or even in a, uh, an email and get a reasonable response, say, within the next, you know, 30 minutes to an hour as opposed to the next day when, you know, everybody's back in the quote-unquote office, so to speak, in Eastern Standard Time, you know, you run the risk of of losing that that person to somebody else who can actually do that. I said though, it's not a necessarily real time information. It doesn't mean that you have to have real time systems with real time inventory and necessarily real time pricing. Although that is an aspiration here and an important one. But in this case, when I say a real time operating environment, I mean twenty four seven, three sixty five. People, as in B two B buyers are expecting to be able to get answers. And so you need to think about, do we have a real-time operating environment culture? Do we have a real-time operating environment, you know, kind of process environment? And do we have a real-time operating environment supported by technology systems? I mean, this is a huge hurdle because, like I said, <laughs> I oftentimes talk to B2B companies and, you know, my my initial diagnosis is that they kind of, understand intellectually that it's the year 2015 and this is the mindset of B2B buyers driven heavily by B2C like customer expectations, but they're still operating again a 20, 2005 company where, you know, the customer service by phone is between the hours of nine and five Eastern Standard Time or worse, they're operating a 1995 company where they don't even have the ability to do a real-time chat with a customer service server. There's nothing real-time at all. You know, all you can do is send an email into what I've experienced before, sometimes as a black hole, which you're hoping gets to a customer service representative or potentially an, a, a sales representative or tier two customer uh, support, and you're just hoping and praying it works because you send it and you don't get a confirmation that anybody's going to get it. Nothing. That's what happened in 1995 and to some extent in 2005, but it's completely unacceptable for a world-class B2B company to be doing something like that 
in the year 2015. Again, that's just one example. Example, uh, you know, there are several. Also, you know, in this new normal and having the right mindset means you need to invest in the right technologies to support that, you know, new buyer journey. I mean, I think in the year 1995 and certainly in the year 2005, um, you know, the funnel, the classic marketing funnel um, predominated. It doesn't anymore. You know, it's not like a lead comes in at the top of the funnel and it qualifies its way down and then makes a purchase and, you know, a big... Uh, <laughs> alarm goes off, customer buys, congratulations. It doesn't work like that anymore. I think we've all seen, you know, we've done research around this, around the journey mapping. Uh, companies like McKinsey have, you know, they've all kind of, we've all kind of come to the same conclusion, which is it's far more complex, unpredictable, and uh, and obviously customer driven and customer centric. They may pop in and get some information by doing a Google search. They may go talk to a peer at a trade show they may then hop on and ask a question of a customer service agent. They may, you know, uh, go into LinkedIn and find out if there's somebody who has any expertise in this space. Whole host of ways over a period of time, again, unpredictable and complex. But just because it's unpredictable and complex doesn't mean that customers have any lower expectation of your ability to deliver at each one of those touch points. Again, They've been conditioned to do and expect that in B2C, um, and now that's crossing over into B2B. So to deliver that, as you can see in the image on the screen here, you know, we're talking about investing in the right kind of technologies, and you know, I, it, they're deep and they're broad. And if you look across the top of the circle there, uh, the broad, you know, we've defined the journey really in six different phases, where there's kind of a discovery phase, an exploration phase, a buy phase, and look how early the buy phase is. In the classic marketing funnel, that was the end. Here, we're halfway through the engagement with a customer, which is a life cycle. It's a customer lifetime uh, engagement, a value. So halfway through, they're making the buy. <laughs> but just as important and easy to measure and influential amongst potential prospects is the use phase, and then the ask phase, and then the engage phase. So you know, it, it is a, it's a, a life cycle. It is, it doesn't end with the purchase. I think we all knew this intellectually, but today there are so many outlets for, for customers to be able to get information and share information interactively and in case, increasingly in real time that, you know, these are not beginning and ends. They are ongoing journeys. And to deliver on that, like I said, you need the depth phase there in the image you need interaction technologies, you need digital delivery technologies, aggregation technologies. We've seen the emergence of microservices, um, you know, where companies are now developing technologies that serve a very specific purpose, and that's it. You know, the use of APIs and, and marketplaces where companies are developing sort of core technology, and then customers are developing extensions and applications that then a company may take back, and if it's successful, productize, uh, and then share with other, com other um, companies, other customers. So even the way companies develop technology is changing. It's far more participatory and co-creative. And then lastly, and certainly not least, the infrastructure to deliver all this. I think we've all seen the success of you know, Amazon Web Services. I mean, I keep seeing stories about how Amazon Web Services may have the most upside of all of the businesses that Amazon offers. And that was something that Amazon developed for themselves to deliver literally that last piece, the infrastructure and context technology for themselves. And it turned out that not only did it work really well for them, but it could work for other companies. So it really is a different way of thinking about this um, versus the way it was done in the past. But as mentioned earlier, it's not all just about technology. In fact, what's as important as the technology you choose is that you have the right mindset around processes and people. And so just as an example, this is from some research that we at Forrester published last year called the Mobile Mind Shift. But it illustrates the point about the value of having the right kind of processes in place. So in the case of mobile, for example, 
We have a framework called the IDEA framework, I-D-E-A, and I stands for identify. So in the case of mobile, we identify the mobile moments and the context. So for example, if you're on your way to the airport and all of a sudden the flight is canceled, the mobile moment is a unique mobile moment and the airlines want to respond to that mobile moment in a unique way. So for example, they don't want to say, hey, would you, um, you know, would you like to get a restaurant at the other location and it closes uh, at 6 o'clock, knowing, knowing now that because your flight was canceled, you're not going to arrive until 8 o'clock. So that piece of information would have been useful in a different context. It's not useful in this particular context. So it's really about identifying the mobile moments that matter to that individual. The E, I'm sorry, the D stands for uh, design. So great, you've identified the mobile moment, but what do you do about it? And so there's a design dimension to this too. When I gave the example of the restaurant, you know, you want to design the interaction so it's something that's more relevant to somebody. So maybe instead of giving them a restaurant that's going to be closed by the time you arrive, it does something like offer to adjust an Uber pickup or offer to adjust a taxi cab pickup or something like that. Uh, again, design the mobile engagement to fit the mobile moment that you've just identified. Third thing is, you know, you've you identified it, you've designed it, now you actually have to build it. Um, I just gave you, you know, a rhetorical d discussion, rhetorical description, but what about actually engineering the platform uh, itself? And so you have to build it so that it's responsive to what people are looking for. And those examples I gave you, you know, overlay B2B on top of that, uh, and you have the same thing. And then, uh, Lastly, the IDEA, the A stands for analyze. And so it's not good enough just to build something and throw it out there uh, and assume it's done. You know, we live in a world now where iteration is very important. In fact, one of my favorite recent stories came from one of my colleagues at our recent Forrester Forum, and they talked about something called desire paths. So at the uh, Michigan State University, when they designed the layout of the campus, the landscapers just put grass down everywhere on the campus. And what was interesting about it was they didn't actually pave anything. They waited some several months to see where people actually wore down the grass, and then they paved that. That's pretty interesting because basically they put something out there that was imperfect and waited for the feedback from the market. And I think you can analogize that here to uh, this framework for processes. The process now needs to include, by definition, customer feedback and interactivity. So I mentioned, too, you know, it's not just about technology, it's about processes, uh, but it's also about partners. And this is the people dimension I want to highlight here uh, in our conversation. So, you know, what we've seen in our research, as you can see the stat here, 87% of BB organizations utilize third-party solution providers for at least one component of their digital strategy. That says the partners are pretty important if, I mean, that's not too far from 100% of companies saying that they are, in fact, using partners to deliver on uh, world-class e-commerce. And there are some areas where they're particularly focused, and these are the top five. One is going global. You know, we've heard from a lot of our clients that you know, they may do a really nice job of building out commerce in a particular country, usually their home country, but they really struggle when it comes to going to other countries. I mean, Alibaba in China right now is specializing in bringing companies to China, for example. You know, you're going to have to rely on an ecosystem, and you should, to expand either into new verticals or new geographies. Systems integration, that's an oldie but a goodie. You know, everybody struggles with this one. Um, there are a lot of good reasons to outsource that, especially if you can chunk off the project and hand it off to somebody who could then work on this 24-7, 365 by moving the project around the world into different time zones. Clear advantage of working with a partner on this one. In fact, I think we've gotten to the point now where there really isn't a good argument for not doing that. E-business technology selection. You know, we do this work at Forrester, as do you know, global commerce service providers, some of whom we've talked about on this call, um, 
you know, it really does help to go to somebody who's been there and done that. You know, if you're a company looking to add in a new platform or rip and replace an existing one uh, and put something new in, you know, it helps to talk to somebody who's actually done it before, and in particular, somebody who's done it in B2B. Uh, they have a broad perspective on this as opposed to you moving up the learning curve entirely on your own. That's a pretty steep climb uh, when others have ascended that, that curve many times over prior to you. QA kind of speaks for itself. You want a third party doing that kind of work because, you know, I used to do this myself when I was a product manager back in a former life. You don't want engineers checking in their own code. <laughs> it's like when you proofread your own papers. You want somebody else to look at it, fresh pair of eyes. And then um, the last one here is post-implementation application development enhancements. You know, that's a, you know, a lot of words in one phrase there, but the point here is that there's a lot of stuff you're going to do after the fact. And you know, a lot of clients think, hey, we've done e-commerce, it's up and running. Yeah, we're getting feedback from the market, but we're not going to do another development cycle for six months or a year. The reality is you're going to be doing development cycles five minutes after you launch this thing because things are going to go wrong. Things are going to change. You're going to get immediate feedback, and immediate feedback demands immediate response. And so, you know, again, post-implementation application development, somebody's going to have to be monitoring this stuff, and somebody's going to have to be positioned to respond quickly. So, you know, we've talked a big deal, a great deal here about using global commerce service providers. And I think, you know, I thought it would be helpful to sort of talk you through how Forrester thinks about this. So, you know, generally and historically, many people refer to what we call today global commerce service providers. They refer to them as um, systems integrators, which falls into this technology service firm's bubble here. But there were also interactive digital agencies that were doing things like buying keywords and developing websites, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the last group is, you know, we've seen this, that there are companies that are doing, you know, um, management consulting work. What's happened actually in this space is that the systems integrators, the digital design companies, and some of these management consulting firms have all added capabilities, mostly the other bubbles on the screen here, and are moving rapidly toward what we call the commerce service provider model, which is inclusive of all three of these different dimensions. So everybody has sort of a, a starting point, but the ending point, you know, a different starting point, I should say, but the ending point is going to be common. And it's going to be firms that offer all three of these capabilities. Uh, so most companies still today are very heavily focused on technology outsourcing. I mean, we showed that list earlier. A lot of that was technology, you know, systems integration work, post-application development work. You know, that's all IT development infrastructure stuff. But one of the surprises that we've seen in the last couple of years is the amount of usability and customer experience uh, outsourcing and marketing and even analytics. So these numbers, you, you don't have a historical perspective here, but if you did, you'd see that you know, 2 through N up here, with the exception of the first one, were much smaller in years past, and they're growing. So you as a company need to think seriously, too, about not just outsourcing IT and development and infrastructure, which I think we discussed a little while ago is kind of a no-brainer on many counts, but you really need to be thinking about what other things can we benefit from a third party or a partner who's been there and done it before. And I think usability is one that falls right into that category. Uh, you know, as much as you want to be able to evaluate your own systems, it's better, just like with QA, to have somebody else take a fresh pair of eyes to it. And so we've seen, we see this number having grown, and we continue to see it, we think, growing uh, going forward. So I want to kind of close with, uh, with two thoughts. One, is about uh, how we look at uh, the global commerce service provider market. For those of you who are familiar with Forrester, you know that we do an analysis uh, usually every other year uh, around certain areas. And one of the areas that we covered earlier this year, although we started the research last year, was the global commerce service provider market. And as you can see on the screen here, uh, I think there are 11 companies, 11, 12 companies up here, that 
we considered, uh, you know, as qualifying for uh, our $1 billion plus in revenue clients. And I think what's interesting about this image is you can see, you know, Accenture and Deloitte and others finished in the leader category. We had some other folks who were in the uh, slope of the strong performers category. This is the first time we had done one for B2B e-commerce. And what was interesting about it is, I think somewhat predictably too, we had a bunch of um, kind of uh, crunching together here. And we expect to see the next time we do this, which will be starting next year and then probably publishing in early 2017, more separation. The reason we didn't see as much separation here uh, and we saw more clustering is because even though companies were coming from different perspectives like we showed in the Venn diagram, they hadn't sort of crystallized all the pieces together. And once one and one and one gets together and equals five or seven, then we'll start to see some separation. So we expect to see more separation going forward, which is not to say that today that there aren't many, um, you know, very viable alternatives and, um, you know, embedded in the cluster there. So we do see some companies that have different specialties. And if you're evaluating a partner, you should consider that. So don't judge it solely based on where they kind of end up in here. Although in this case, it's pretty easy because they're <laughs> fairly clustered together. Uh, other ways we do, we have people in the far right corner and people in the far left. And so it's a lot visually easier to see that. But I would encourage you to think about some of the companies in the middle of the pack here because just because they showed up in the middle of the pack as a global commerce service provider, um, we don't believe necessarily that they aren't particularly strong in one specific area like mobile or systems integration work or usability, for example. So when you, if you manage to see our wave, we provide a spreadsheet, which I think is 77 criteria in it. You can go in and you can adjust each of those criteria based on what's more important to you. So if you're really all about usability, you can weight that one higher. And if you did, you'd actually literally see these bubbles move. Same thing with systems integration. Same thing with, uh, you know, B2B commerce strategy. Point is, you can move these things around and make it serve whatever purpose you want, and you'll see, you'll start to see separation based on the weighting that you choose. But I think the key point here, and the key point of this whole discussion, if it hasn't become obvious so far, it should be by now, that, you know, you can't do this on your own. It really does take a village. And, um, and there's a good point in doing that because things are changing so rapidly. Companies have such high demands. And worse than that, customers have increasingly high demands um, on the demand side. And they expect that, you know, companies can respond 24-7, 365 with high-quality information, provide all the features and functionalities they've grown accustomed to on sites like Amazon and elsewhere, it is impossible, I don't care how good you are, it's really impossible for a B2B company to deliver on all of that on their own. It would be foolhardy, I think, to think that. Uh, and, and there's no reason to do it. Um, not when you've got partners who have been there and done that across a whole panoply of disciplines, like from front end to middle of the stack to the back end. Uh, but one thing I will stress here is that not all partners are made the same. And you want to make sure that you choose partners who have actually actually done this before, not talked about it, don't, you know, allude to it, don't, you know, put out press releases saying they have the capability. Ask them for references, talk to those references, find out what work they've done. And I can tell you the work that we've done where we dig that deep and we do that kind of due diligence, the last slide showed you there are quite a few options out there uh, for companies looking to move into the world-class uh, space. So on that note, uh, I'll conclude my section here and hand it back to Mark. Mark? Okay, so, uh, well, Andy, uh, thank you for that excellent presentation. And moving forward, we're going to hear on defining, developing, and deploying a digital business and strategy in the B2B world, as well as case studies from Elena and Kevin from EPAM. Take it away. Yes, hi, everybody. Uh, so, EPAM was uh, very prominently featured in the B2B wave, 
uh, and we wanted to come and speak to everybody about sort of our unique perspective on B2B commerce and what it takes to actually get it done. And just a few words about EPAM. Uh, we've been in business for the past 20 years, uh, and, and you might wonder why you've never heard of us, especially in the context of commerce. And the reason is that we've been helping large software product companies make products. So the Googles and the SAPs of the world, and even some of the actual commerce providers for whom we had actually developed the platforms that they sell today. Uh, and so it wasn't until the mid-2000s where we really started to focus on the enterprise and really started to take a perspective and build a practice around serving customers both in B2B and B2C channels. Uh, and the focus, uh, at least one of our most significant focuses today, is really digital transformation. And so we, what we've done in the past probably four or five years is really taken our very uh, unique experience in helping to develop actual platforms and software products for the market and turn that towards looking at how we productize the implementation approach to commerce within the enterprise and then specifically how we take that approach to B2B in the context of commerce and the broader digital transformation challenge. Uh, and one of the things that we learned uh, as we went across uh, a kind of a number of these customer journeys, as Andy described, is that uh, the key success factor uh, was, the, was the ability for companies, both us as well as our clients, to put together skills of people who were coming from multiple different disciplines and combining those, com combining those skills and combining these teams into what we're calling hybrid teams. This ability to bring to the market the hybrid capabilities of teams is really what differentiates service providers who are pure plays versus people that can go end to end. And so with that, I'm just going to ask Kevin Labick, who heads up our digital engagement practice, to really talk about some of the shifts and trends we're seeing that underpin our practice uh, emphasis. Thanks, Elena. Uh, hi, everybody. So um, I think you guys um, know some of what I'm going to talk about uh, either implicitly or you're, you get it, you're, you know it in your bones, right, because you're living it. But, um, you know, to speak a little bit about what Andy had been mentioning, there's all the, there are these technology fuel trends that are wreaking havoc uh, across industry um, and, you know, certainly not just within the B2C space, but absolutely in the B2B space as well, all right? And so some of these, I think, are very familiar to you. Um, age of the customer, the shift to mobile, the rise of big data, this incredible need for innovation at a more rapid pace, um, the Internet of Things and connected appliances, and the digitization of physical spaces. And so, of course, these trends, these issues need to be addressed. And you'll address them, right? And I think what, probably why you're on a webinar like this is as you're seeking, you know, answers to how to how do you address it. You'll it really requires approaching uh, by developing out innovative digital products and services. But you know, a traditional enterprise that is looking to design, conceptualize, design, deploy, launch something truly innovative into the space, um, and then try to maintain it, that's a very disruptive act for them, and that forces not only the ability to kind of think through a different approach and different products to put out there, but you yourselves really need to change as an organization, which is, you know, why we recommend and, you know, our philosophy is that you have to transform from a more traditional enterprise into what we're calling a digital enterprise. And so attributes um, of a digital enterprise, if you could, would be, you know, this is a company in which the customer is really the center of the universe. This is your focus, your processes, your budgeting. It's all centered around the customer. It's where you really embrace the idea that experience is your differentiator, right? Given, you know, global supply chains and the ability for your competitors to really adopt the same tactics that you are from a kind of systems perspective um, means that where you will differentiate is in the experience you give those customers. Data needs to drive decisions for you. Data needs to drive that experience as well, so the really embracing data and making use of it. Um, there's also this notion of being in perpetual beta, a continuous evolution culture, right? Whatever you're going to put out in the marketplace has to be seen as your hypothesis, which must be tested, measured, validated, and then improved upon. And then finally, it's critical 
that you've democratized your technology landscape. And this is what's going to allow the real data, the real capabilities of your enterprise. You have to make that accessible um, to, your, to your marketers, to your customer-facing people, so that they, very, they can very quickly innovate and try different methods but use it with, you know, without having to go through very long development cycles, integration cycles, in which the moment will be lost for them. So we can continue. You know, so our focus uh, as EPAM is to work with clients, help them innovate, develop these breakthrough strategies and experiences, while also guiding this organizational change. It has to be both, right? You can't just focus on the products and services you put out there, but you really have to look to yourself as to, you know, how do you evolve as an organization that can actually host, develop, and, and evolve the products that you're uh, deploying? And so, you know, overall, our attitude is speed kills when you don't have it. Um, you know, I don't think anyone here would believe that it's a new thing for a B2B organization to need to be customer-centric, right? I don't think that's new, right? Adopting consumer strategies or, or B2C-like strategies, right? We've heard about this for years now. So if it's not in play already, uh, there's trouble. And there's going to be two types of organizations. There are the disruptors and there's the disrupted, right? And so it's, a, it's your ability to surf those trends puts you on one or the other side of that line. And so how do you do it? So Andy uh, talked earlier about enlisting Agile for analysis and refinement. So it's no surprise that EPAM, coming from our product development roots, would agree with him. And so Agile, you know, we just want to make sure you, on, you know, this point is clear. It's not just a software development methodology, but it's the act of putting together multidisciplinary teams, adaptive planning, rapid development, and it's that continuous improvement philosophy, which you need to uh, deploy against your strategy, against your design, and not just your development efforts. So you have to think of it not purely as a method, but more as a mindset. And so with that, I want to hand it over to um, some of the folks within our digital practice who's going to talk to you about specific tactics and strategies <laughs> that they have used with clients to great success. Thanks, Kevin. This is Thanks, Kevin. This is Rebecca. I'll kick it off. Um, we just want to set up the challenge um, and what we're all facing on the phone. And with our recent B2B and B2C clients, a ton of back-end complexity to be ready for the rapidly changing ecosystems of today's customers. As Andy had mentioned, with the Amazon-like infrastructure, so new CMSs, upgrading e-commerce platforms, even new fulfillment or customer service technologies, and merging that with the desire to drive the new technology through that best-in-class, next-generation customer experience. And of course, the end goal, driving more revenue through that. This is a call to action for our team to apply the art and science of our user experience, design, content, strategy, and analytics practice areas into that agile, cohesive, data-driven process that aligns and drives our product roadmap, as Kevin had mentioned. So next, Robin and I will show you some examples of how we've pulled together our top insights and themes from the field, from our, our latest commerce projects um, that we've undertaken, and um, how that thinking is best demonstrated. Hi, everyone. This is Robin. From our approach and subsequent learnings, um, here's one of our results that we've seen. EPAM has taken the insights from many of our client challenges to create our own best-in-class commerce accelerator to support B2C and B2B. This accelerator incorporates all the key features and functionality prioritized through our in-depth testing and optimization programs with some of our top commerce clients. The following slides will um, show you some key themes that highlight the most important aspects to commerce today. So for the first one, here's a great example. A major Canadian retailer of ours that we're working with today challenged us with creating a personalization roadmap to both test potential tactics and implement them over time as it makes sense with the data that we can collect. 
So one of the most important aspects of any testing and optimization roadmap is the ability to discern how to best integrate personalization tactics into a customer experience. You can collect data on any sort of interaction with a store, but how do you make the most relevant in the customer journey at different touch points? For example, on a landing page, what type of personalized product recommendations makes the most sense for a browser at this level, and how does that differ from a page deeper in the shopping path? The first key theme that we have found is extreme relevance. It's about personalized product recommendations based on the customer's behaviors and interests. Those behaviors could include past purchase history, online or in-store, on-site browsing behaviors, and collecting interests is the main key aspect, either through contextual selection by the user, such as subscribe to this activity, or leveraging the on-site data of the user to segment down to activity levels and interests. On another recent project with an electronics retailer who actually has a B2C, B2B, and employee site, one of the key questions that came up was, how do you better personalize account management since different users will have different needs? The out-of-box solutions from the providers um, of account management is almost too much for most users to handle. A big evolution in account management for B2B centers is around creating a more use, usable and useful experience. It's not just about the past purchase orders and setting up user accounts and permissions. Business users also expect a deeper integration between themselves and the retailer and how can they grow the engagement to better serve their needs. We call this extreme account management. It's about relevant and useful information to the customer. It includes complex, varied data points visualized and orga organized into an insightful, actionable mosaic for the customer. It continues to personalize over time as the customer interacts with the site and makes purchases. It also provides opportunities for the customer to provide you additional information about themselves and tailor the experience to their work streams and their needs. So key features here include displaying past order history, browsing history, purchase orders, relevant content such as blogs, articles, how-tos, product recommendations, and loyalty rewards information. The next big topic we covered very recently in some usability testing within our team. We learned a lot about a searcher's thought process to contextualize the relationship between data and a natural search flow. This is something that's really evolving in commerce every day now. A big lesson learned here is one size does not fit all when it comes to search. A varying amount of detail needs to be layered into the experience. And this was the perfect opportunity then to go from the qualitative side to then the quantitative to test various pieces of the UI and flow to see which pieces really move the dial as far as our search flow. So through our testing and optimization programs with many of our clients, we've learned a lot about how metadata and product attribution fit into a more robust search experience. Search functionality allows for multifaceted, category-specific filtering, and we need to be able to support that infrastructure with more usable interfaces and interactions. Providing customers a guided shopping experience is a must. Um, this includes robust filtering options, which allow users to quickly sort the products and find the product that is perfect for them. Inline quick views provide the ability to easily scan product details and navigate to the next product without leaving the product listing page. And another key feature includes inline promotions or content highlights, which can aid in the purchase decision in line with the product grid. Here's another great example of where uh, data-driven design and our testing and optimization program is working really well for one of our largest retail clients that possesses quite a diverse category assortment. We were able to test different landing page content through our personalization roadmap that informed what type of message and creative was most effective 
for different product categories, which helps elevate the relevancy of that category to that customer. Deeper content integration is the next step for more meaningful commerce experiences. How do you connect the customer's environment, their external motivators, and daily thought stream into commerce better? The answer is content that supports the purchase as well as the customer. So content that shows the depth of the product lines but also provides expert advice, lo local activities, and social integration, which enables the customer to feel more connected to the products. It is about not only connecting with the customer for the initial sale, but inspiring them to use the products and enhance loyalty with your brand. And then to round out our commerce learnings, the bottom line for our clients today, though, is how are we connecting these richer content experiences back to the commerce-driven activities across multiple channels? To take content integration a step further, social integration is being talked a lot about in the B2B commerce world, and we've demonstrated within our accelerator a number of ways you can address this. This can happen through enhanced product reviews and ratings, including rating systems based on actual customer research, how-to videos and content, along with allowing real customers to share images of their use of the products along with the review. In summary, the key themes to always keep in mind when approaching your commerce experience is extreme relevance, extreme account management, a, guiding, a guided shopping experience, Display category expertise through deep, relevant content. And remember that commerce, content, and social combined bring together the experience. Now I'm going to hand it back to Mark for the Q&A portion. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, uh, that excellent presentation. Our first question is for EPAM. What do you see as the top three challenges to rolling out an, an omni-channel platform from a B2B perspective? Hey, hi everyone, um, it's Dave here. I think I'll, I'll take this one. So, top three challenges. Um, start number one, data. Data requirements and the data volumes tend to be larger than when you're working with corresponding B2C implementations, especially when you're factoring in potentially an extended product range, enriched product data, uh, customer-specific project ranges and customer-specific pricing and organizational hierarchies. All of these are going to be dependent on the specific market and what is important to your customers. So, um, for an example, if a customer, um, what's really important to them could be uh, order logistics, so the product information for the product itself, its inner, the outer, the packaging, um, how it's packaged in multiple packs and palleting information plays a big part. Okay, going on to number two, let's think on architecture and integration, which kind of leads on from data. Uh, we've talked about the data just then. There's going to be multiple back office systems mastering that data, hence there's going to be a lot of integration and integration patterns to be considered. In a, in a um, legacy traditional approach, we'd be moving around and syncing lots of data. The pattern now is heading towards an API-driven approach where those platform components allow it. And the that approach, whether it's API driven, um, whether we're moving data, is going to be influenced by NFRs and data volumes. Uh, point number three, customer adoption. So you're going to want a way to get your existing customers on the platform and using the platform, not just for the benefit of the increased product information you're hopefully going to give them, but also as a way of capturing their orders. So trying to accommodate multiple ways of ordering other than the online journeys, so whether that's via Excel spreadsheet uploads or procurement system integration, that sort of thing. Um, I think that covers it. I hope it answers your question. And here's a, uh, here's a follow up question uh, for, uh, for EPAM. How is service design addressing unique channel requirements within a customer base? Hey, it's uh, Matt Farr here from EPAM VP of Service Design. So we've been working for the last 12 months um, in lots of sectors, but specifically within commerce, really trying to understand the customer service journey across all those channels. So, you know, we don't just look at digital, for instance, we also look at, you know, the physical retail space and environment. How do we connect, uh, you know, the digital uh, experiences, whether they're mobile or web, uh, with, the, uh, with the physical store? And that's something that is, uh, is absolutely critical if we're going to create that consistent kind of holistic experience for the customer. 
um, and um, and also thinking about also how we would integrate that with things like the voice. You know, when uh, when it is when we're trying to integrate customer complaints. So um, actually thinking to so one of the first things that we would do uh, in our group is uh, is to map out that customer journey. Um, as a kind of a state of play. So what's happening now? How do we understand the customer's journey uh, all the way through uh, you know, that purchasing cycle, but also uh, really understanding the channels that they're moving through. You know, we want to make them feel valuable. We want to make them feel like they, um, you know, they're really being looked after uh, through, that, uh, through that commerce journey. So the, uh, the role of the, of the service design team really to start off with is to map out the entire service right now, so today. Um, and then importantly, um, it's also important to look at, you know, how is that going to evolve? So if we're really truly going to be strategic, um, then we, we then we need to look at the future, right? So uh, in 2020, for instance, if we want to look that far ahead, how a device is going to change? Are there any other trends that are ultimately going to affect uh, the future of that customer journey? Um, and then by understanding that, we're able to map out how to get from today um, all the way through to you know meeting the uh, the needs of the future, um, and that really is what gives us our roadmap. So it's very much a kind of a customer-driven, um, multi-channel uh, journey that enables us to uh, to, to deliver that uh, that kind of confidence in our strategy. Okay, a follow-up question for, uh, for you folks once again: What role does service design play in establishing the right change management and organizational structure to accommodate? these omnichannel platforms that we just have uh, spent the last few minutes talking about? Oh yeah, another question for me by the sounds of it. So, uh, um, I, I mean I've just articulated hopefully the, um, you know, the, the challenges that we have in making sure that the customer experience across those multi-channels is, is seamless, is uh, you know, we're, we're striving to create that customer excellence model. Uh, and so when you really look at the detail and the challenges that in, internally organizations have, um, you know, we start to find that there's some fairly fundamental uh, challenges within the organizations that need to be addressed. So for instance, you know, there are, you'll see this within most organizations, certainly the ones that we work with, you know, ahead of retail, and there's also ahead of online, and there's probably ahead of customer service, uh, and there may be different heads for the different channels. Um, you know, what we find is by articulating the customer journey, presenting that at sea level within organizations, um, for the first time, um, it, sometimes this can be, you know, really, uh, uh, you know, fairly fundamental. They've never seen uh, these uh, kind of multi-channel connected experiences before, and uh, for the first time, they see where the uh, where the, the 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 siloed business that they've created uh, inhibits the um, the success of their customer journey. Right. So, um, by going through a service design approach um, with uh, with our clients, um, we often find that we start to impact on organizational structures potentially, um, but certainly you know where uh, they need to join the dots. So, how do we better connect head of retail and the retail team uh, are responsible for the physical store uh, with the digital store. So you know you can see that uh, by taking this outside-in approach, putting the customer at the center of our universe, you know, we really start to drive uh, uh, actual um, organizational change. Um, so it, it's a fairly fundamental part of our, our role within. Okay, we have time for one final question. This question is for Andy. Andy, believe it or not, there are a lot of customers that are still not aware of the Amazon-like experience and not in 2015 technology. So the question is, how would you recommend to start bringing the awareness and encouraging them and perhaps using that company that already has in place if they're going to influence customers using an Amazon-like experience? What do they need to do, in other words, if they want to be more like Amazon? Well, it starts with... Uh, customer segmentation. It really does. You know, you've got to understand what your customers are looking for. Every company is different. Every market's different. In some cases, products are different. Um, and on the buy side, we often say there really isn't just one B2B buyer. There's at least two and arguably three or four different, completely different types. I mean, certainly you have a procurement professional whose job it is to buy things or to set standards and policies but they're not really a user. And then you've got the B2B buyer who oftentimes is, is a user themselves. So think about, you know, which of those two you're addressing. If you're addressing both, how you approach them. They have different needs, different everything. But it's got to start with really detailed understanding of who your customers are, and not just today, but in three years. Because what you're building right now is going to be for, for, you know, two to three years down the road. You're not going to rebuild this thing every year. So 
as you take a step forward, think about skating to where the puck is going to be, not where it is. And think, you know, spend 80% of your time understanding and trying to figure out who your customers are going to be. We do work with companies to do this. Other companies do too. It's a really important exercise and not just a thought experiment because, you know, obviously you don't live in the eternal now. And when you're building things, it's going to be for the future. So start with that and then work your way through setting some objectives and some strategies and then figure out what technology you want to implement to serve all that. Okay. Well, Andy, thank you. And with that, we conclude today's webinar. I'd like to thank Andy Hoare from Forrester. I'd like to thank Elena and Kevin and the EPAM team for their participation today. And as a reminder, everyone on the call will get an email in the next day or two with instructions on how to obtain today's presentation. Thank you.